Hi everyone, I'm here today speaking with Dan Scheffler. Um, Scheffler, uh, that's right. Scheffler, um, a professor of philosophy at Memoria College in Kentucky. Um, and I wanted to speak with Dan because we've um, interacted a few times online about, about uh, a shared interest in Platonism, a uh, shared interest in in the philosophy of Plato and um, the phenomenological tradition as well, and how those branches of philosophy um, kind of interact and relate with one another. Um, so, Dan, I know you've um, you've studied um, some of the realist phenomenologists. Um, uh, Von, von Hildebrand in particular. Um, just thought it might be worth starting off asking sort of what, like how do you, how do you understand their projects, what they were up to in the 1930s or 20s um, as distinct from, uh, I don't know, other branches of phenomenology? Um, is, yeah. Sure, yeah. So probably it would be helpful to start with uh, articulating what the project of phenomenology in general was and what the, all the different phenomenologists sort of had in common because it was a uh, fairly uh, varied movement. A lot of people went by the name phenomenologist or said they were doing phenomenology and that meant kind of different things. There's sort of a common core there of feeling that uh, philosophy had... Um, ramified into all of these different schools that have their own kind of conceptual uh, systems that are more and more and more detached from the actual givens of experience. Uh, so, you know, something like empiricism uh, ostensibly starts in the British empiricist tradition with people like John Locke. Uh, you know, with, with fairly common sense observations about what you can see, taste, touch, hear, feel, you know, and then builds from there. But then before you know it, you've got these uh, empiricists that are building up from assumptions about, say, atoms. But I've never, I've never seen any atoms, you know. Uh, yeah. th th these are not things that you can see, touch, taste, hear, feel. Um, but but apparently, if you're going to be a card carrying empiricist, then you've you've got to start with kind of having this assumption set of assumptions having to do with the physical sciences, or you've got the Kantian idealists over here that, you know, over the course of a few hundred years built up this whole set of assumptions having to do with Kant's categories and the, uh, you know, the, the different methods there that he outlines in his critiques. And the, the common core that I see amongst the phenomenologists is saying, Oh, wait, wait this is, a lot of this is just getting pretty far away from what is immediate. What do we, what do we actually experience in the immediacy of our lived consciousness? What can we actually say about that? And can we get disciplined about specifying what's going on in consciousness? Now, then that, there's a kind of fundamental divide there uh, once you say that because you can then make consciousness and the structures of consciousness the end goal. You can you can think that that's, that's the whole show and that maybe, in fact, you can take it in an idealist direction. You can maybe yeah. think that it's, in fact, consciousness that is constituting reality, and that's why it is important to return to the structures that are given in consciousness. Um, but the realist uh, direction in phenomenology, people, some of my favorites, like Dietrich von Hildebrand or Edith Stein or Max Scheler, say, no, 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 uh, consciousness is fundamentally of reality. So we are conscious of something out there that really is real. Uh, there is an intelligible structure prior to our intelligence coming along and grasping that. Um, so the, de the desire to uh, return to what's actually given in consciousness is because we think that that's actually going to get us closer to the truth. 
Mm-hmm. That's going to lead us to what is what is real, what what the world is really like. Um, so if I understand because... you, yeah. Go ahead. So and this is related to Brentano's idea about intentionality, if I'm not mistaken, the idea that consciousness itself is always about something. I'm conscious of something, but it it seems in what you're saying that that. The, the realist phenomenologists, um, Stein, von Hildebrand, Shaler, are saying that consciousness is sort of pointing us or just pointing us somewhere um, beyond itself, or it has a transcendent orientation. Um, would that be fair? Like, I, because it's, it seems the way, I, I suppose one could go into a kind of Barclayan subjectivism about consciousness of it's just self-constituting it's all in our heads kind of thing and so that move is being resisted somehow Mm -hmm. through a pointing to some transcendent plane um is that a fair characterization yeah so you mentioned uh brentano and um so the the key word here is intentional right this is uh uh, word that all realist phenomenologists make a make a lot of um so, and and so just to clarify for any listeners maybe who who are unfamiliar with this technical usage of the term often we say intentional in ordinary speech to mean that something is on purpose or is purposeful mm-hmm. um but in in this technical usage when we say that a state is intentional we just mean that it's about something it, it has this property of aboutness. It's pointed towards something. Mm-hmm. So my thought of the Eiffel Tower is about the Eiffel Tower uh, mm-hmm. or the love that I feel for my wife is about my wife in mm-hmm. some way. Um, and one very uh, key observation before we get too much further is just to make sure we understand that um, Intentionality is not the same as a causal relationship. Okay. So, for example, let's say that I, uh, you know, do some drugs <laughs> and this messes with my brain chemistry in some way. And so I feel a sense of elation. That sense of elation is not about the drugs, right? It might be caused by the drugs. And maybe I even know that it's caused by the drugs. Okay. So, my knowledge that my sense of elation is caused by the drugs that yeah, would be yeah. intentional. but this the feeling of, of elation itself is not intentional okay mm-hmm. so uh a, a basic observation that many of these brentano shaler hildebrand they all make a similar uh, observation is that one of the most fundamental uh data of our consciousness is uh this basic intentional structure of not all conscious states, but of a lot of conscious states, okay? That they come with an arrow built into their very nature, built into their structure. Yeah, yeah. They they manifest, if, if we just look at our own states of consciousness, they say about themselves, so to speak, I am not just me. I am about something. I am myself and something behind me. Okay, I am about something. And this is is an argument for the realist position fundamentally, that there is something beyond our thought. It's that which the thought is about. Now, that's not on its own. Just observing this intentional structure of conscious states is not itself a conclusive argument because, of course, we have – we're not infallible. (laughs) We have faulty conscious states all the time. You know, uh, Uh this could be a systematic deception of our mind, maybe. Okay. Uh, but wouldn't that be quirky, right? Like (laughs) that, that would require some serious, uh, you know, accounting, uh, for us to be able to say, look, a a huge range of our basic at the, uh, before you even can get to much reasoning about anything at all, the very apparatus that we use to think has this basic structure of pointing towards something beyond itself. Mm -hmm. Right. (laughs) Uh, So if that is systematically an error, then we've got a a real problem. (laughs) 
<laughs> right? And and a lot more explaining to do than just, oh, you know, sometimes we hallucinate or something like <laughs> so, so, some kind of hand waving that Descartes does in the uh, first meditation, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then so I guess that raises questions about, you know, what is being pointed to. And this is something that, that particularly interests me is the whole question of value. So, so there's always a, a, to use the term you used, like an arrow in consciousness pointing to an to something, but these some things to which consciousness is directed seem, and this is where I find Shayla particularly brilliant, they seem to have a kind of order to them. Um, following, I think, in the tradition of Augustine, the idea that some um, intents have, for example, a greater hold on us. Um, they um, command more attention, maybe for longer, in more depth. And I remember Shayla talks about some of these qualities as, as such as endurance, such as depth, which sort of speak of a kind of, um, well, realm of value, really, <laughs> uh, to, to which we're responding. And in, to greater and lesser degrees. Um, so I wonder what your thoughts are on that, because I think there's there's a connection there to some of the platonic insights about, about the ontology of value and such. Um, yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, our intentionality tells us, okay, there's there's something out there. Mm -hmm. right that or at least that my conscious states are pointed towards something beyond myself yeah but that's not all that they manifest they don't just manis manifest the sort of bare facticity of of things so when i have a thought about my wife i have some sort of awareness that my wife is is out there <laughs> right it's not just that that oh fact like sort of <laughs> android <laughs> style fact that there's there is a human female out there that I have entered into some sort of contractual obligation with or something. Uh, that fact appears to me already laden with importance, mm -hmm. with meaning, yeah. with depth, right? Yeah. It, it calls out to me in a certain way. And, and not just that one fact, but a, a huge uh, range of facts. Now, you know, so Shaler has some phenomenological criteria that he uses to kind of establish this hierarchy of, of values. And um, he, he famously argued uh, against uh, the Kantian perspective, which was dominant in, in his kind of world uh, at the time in, in Germany in the early 20th century. The Kantians were really mm -hmm. top dogs. So the Kantians argued, okay, so you, you can have the material content of your thoughts, but the moral worth of an act comes purely not from its material content, but from the formal character of your will, when you will to, to act according to a certain maxim, mm -hmm. okay? So, all, so value uh, derives from a formal property uh, of the maxim that we will, okay? Mm -hmm rather than its material content. That's what you're responding to. And ultimately, what's that material property that we really care about for the Kantians? It's universal universalizability. Yeah. Or from another angle, you might think of it as consistency with myself, all right? Mm -hmm. So not making a, a special pleading with my own will, okay? But Shaler argued, no, 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 that's not, that's not quite right. When I see somebody forgiving somebody else, let's say, or I see an act of kindness, generosity. Um, there's more than just, oh, that's uh, formally speaking, you know, that's the kind of act that I could will to be universalized. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's, a, there's a thickness to that uh, experience in consciousness. And when I attend to the, the experience itself, I realize that, oh, there's something there in the actual content of the act that is calling out to me and manifesting itself as a bearer of value. Okay, so Shaler very famously argued for the rehabilitation of the material content of value. 
Now he he has this whole set of uh, criteria by which you can you know rank these, and he's he uh, assigns uh, all the values that we typically talk about into this this hierarchy. Okay, but Dietrich von Hildebrand, who's my my favorite, uh, uh, was a friend of Shaler's, uh, sort of younger colleague. Um, mm -hmm. Hildebrand actually studied under Husserl, and uh, he and and Shaler were roommates uh, for a short period, and. Uh, and and Hildebrand would hold these uh, discussion circles where he would invite Shaler in. But this was one point where Hildebrand and Shaler actually uh, really disagreed, and they had this ongoing uh, debate because Hildebrand thought, no, it's not just it's not just one hierarchy of values, and we can kind of locate any perception of value or importance in this hierarchy and Shaler thought the mistake that we often make, like if there's, if there's a sin ever, mm -hmm. that's because we're valuing a lower value or a higher value. We're getting our priorities wrong. You know? Yeah. But Hildebrand said, no, that's not, that's not quite right. Cause I actually, when I, when I really attend to my experiences of things calling out to me, there's really two completely heterogeneous experiences that, that I, that I see here. OK, mm -hmm. and there's a kind of war between these two experiences. The one is when I have an experience where there's it, the intentionality of the value experience is really out there on the object side. Mm -hmm. So I can see two strangers who really have nothing to do with me and a fa father forgives his son, for example. And I can just see that that is good. I have this basic perception that that is beautiful, that that calls out to me as something that I should admire, even though it doesn't really do anything for me at all, positively or negatively, yeah. right? Yeah, yeah. Conversely, there's another kind of experience where uh, I'm, at the, I'm at the counter and uh, we're ordering ice cream and out of the selection of the 31 different flavors, you know, there's the one flavor that's just calling out to me. And I can see, I think most people would Im immediately see upon reflection that that's not so much because of something objective about that flavor of ice cream as opposed to the other. It's not in the ice cream itself. It's somehow in me, in my sensibility. So when I notice that, oh, yeah, yeah chocolate chip cookie dough or whatever it is that I really want, uh, why does that call out to me? Why is that grabbing my attention? Why does that motivate me so much mm -hmm. it has more to do with me and my tastes and my desires it's going to satisfy something in me likewise or just if, if i'm hungry in general right I, I think we've all had this experience where uh you get really hungry if you've gone for a you know a day or so and you haven't eaten suddenly stuff in your environment that would have you know 12 hours ago not been that noticeable not that important starts suddenly really calling out to you so is that has your environment changed? <laughs> no, obviously you've changed, yeah, right? Yeah. You're the thing that's different now. So uh, Hildebrand thinks that these are two totally different kinds of, of importance in our experience. Mm -hmm. The one he called the subjectively satisfying mm -hmm. and the other he called the important in itself, which then sometimes he shortens to just value, the German term being wert. Okay. Ah, and he thinks so the, the ice most... Cream... Sorry, go on. Go, go, go ahead. So the ice cream wouldn't be technically valuable? Uh... Correct. Right. It's the subjectively satisfying. Right. Uh, now, they're, they're, one in the same experience can have both of those going on at the same time, right? Mm -hmm. So let's suppose that I'm watching a film. There might be something that I recognize. Okay, they're objectively, independent of, of my satisfaction and entertainment value, whatever, I can recognize that this is objectively a great piece of, of art that something significant is going on here that high values of, of, you know, human achievement are being depicted here. And also at the same time, I'm having a good time and I was kind of stressed out today and I am, I find this relaxing. Mm -hmm. Right. So maybe the ice cream, we could make a case that, you know, <laughs> I don't know, maybe, maybe there is some sort of objective value in ice cream as a culinary dish or something like that. Um, but predominantly when I'm choosing one flavor of ice cream over the other, what's going on is that subject, the subjectively satisfying and mm. not value. 
And so uh, it's not a question of prioritization. And he does think within these two realms, we do make mistakes of prioritization. So sometimes uh, let's say that I uh, place the aesthetic value of a work of art over the moral value of not killing somebody. <laughs> right. And so I, I think that it's a it's it's a good thing maybe to like murder somebody in order to steal their Van Gogh or something. Yeah. OK. Uh, or or you could cook up a, a scenario. So that would be the Shaler type. What's going on there? We've got two things that really are objectively valuable, but I have, you know, I have some sort of fundamental mistake that I'm making about which one is the higher value. Obviously, the person's life is a much higher value than, you know, and any even a even a great work of art, right? Mm -hmm. um, so, but he thinks so that the, most of the time, what's going on is that it's not a mistaken priority. It's that we are choosing to turn towards my own subjective satisfaction and away from the world of objective value. Whereas a truly good person, and all of us hopefully uh much of the time we do turn away from our own subjective satisfaction and are responding to a totally different way of thinking which is the world of that which is uh important in itself mm -hmm. so for von hildebrand they're two separate spheres almost two autonomous spheres in a way of the the subjectively satisfying and what is uh valuable in itself correct yeah and then, so that's then a question of the will, is it? The, uh, is, is that a question of choice as to as to w which sphere we sort of hab habitually inhabit in some way? Correct. Yeah. Uh, which uh, he he puts it in terms of which do you make sovereign in your in your actions, right? Uh, oh. So you know, there's there's no there's nothing wrong with preferring things that are satisfying to me <laughs> you know if i'm hungry i should eat uh yeah. if if i'm you know at the ice cream counter i should pick the flavor of ice cream that i enjoy the best but there's something wrong if that thing in me the thing that uh is appealed to by wanting to be satisfied if that is dominant if that is sovereign over the aspect of my psychology that responds to the objective call of things in the world. Mm -hmm. That's messed up, <laughs> right? Um, if, if that's my, my pattern of living, then I'm going to become a worse and worse kind of person. Conversely, mm -hmm. if I habitually uh, make sovereign the uh, thing in me that responds to the objective value of things in the world, over against what I personally find subjectively satisfying, that's going to make me a, a better kind of person. Mm. Now, he calls that thing that's doing that choosing. So the, the will is, I mean, you, you use your will in a whole lot of ways. But he, uh -huh. he refers to this um, free personal center, the, the sort of sovereign I. Mm -hmm. And he makes a very interesting uh, observation here, and I, I've written about this, um, that a lot of what we do, a lot of our behaviors don't ultimately proceed from that innermost core of who I, who I really am. A lot of what we do is kind of habitual. It's kind of automatic. Uh, it's just proceeding from my instincts, reactions, what have you. But at core, I have this thing in me that can ultimately uh, what his word that he uses is undersign it, like on a contract, right? I can, I can put my name on the dotted line, so to speak. And even if something does proceed from my instincts or my nature or whatever, I can say yes, that's me. That's what I want to do. That that is an act of Dan Scheffler. Conversely, there's stuff that, and I, this is the experience of addiction. Right? This is basically what addiction is is when I experience uh, acts and maybe I can't even stop it. Maybe I don't have the will to, to stop acting a certain way. But nevertheless, at, a, at an innermost core, I'm like refusing to put my name on the dotted line. I'm like, no, I disown that. I alienate that act. I don't want to keep on doing that. 
Now, just doing that is not necessarily a guarantee that you're going to stop whatever behavior that that is. That's the mm -hmm. mystery of, of Akrasia. But he says that uh, by doing so, you decapitate. Uh, <laughs> that's a very strong word. You decapitate well, yeah. its power in your in a very profound way. And over time, uh, it it that has profound effects. Mm -hmm. So it's a little more than just the will. I hope that I hope that clarifies it. Yeah, no, that's good because I mean. You know, what I was thinking was this notion of Thoimos um, from the Phaedrus, like the, I don't know if it is related, but like the, that, you know, in, in Plato's Phaedrus, we have like the appetites at the bottom and like uh, reason uh, atop and like so, a kind of the spirited mediating factor, which mm -hmm. seems to sort of be uh, working between them. And I don't know, like there's there's something in what you described there about von Hildebrand as the appetites pursuing the subjectively satisfying, you know, reason, reason being that light in us, which can uh, see value as such. Mm -hmm. um, yes, yeah, so there's something of like an Augustinian like Ordo Amore here. Like, like how, you know, I, I, it's a great mystery, I'm sure, but like how to, to transform ourselves in the direction away from the subjectively, the merely subjectively satisfying, which I'm sure has its place, but you know, towards the the contemplation, the adoration of what is good in itself, how that project is to be affected is, of course, like the central ethical question. <laughs> like, uh, yeah, that's the million dollar uh, question. I mean, that's that's the meaning uh, of life right there, basically. Sure. Um, and so, so there's, yeah, to there's switch something to, about the heart to, and the affections, I think. In that, yeah. I, it might be helpful to switch to Plato talk for a second and kind yeah. of maybe translate between those two realms. They, hmm. It's not immediately clear exactly how Plato's sure. tripartite soul and the to two categories of importance and Hildebrand uh, necessarily line up. So my reading of uh, Plato is that the lowest aspect of the soul, the epithematicon, the appetites, that is fundamentally not truth responsive. So these, uh, these appetites are like simple machines, basically. Uh, if you physiologically get to dehydrated, you will become thirsty. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is the example that Socrates uses in the first few books of the, of the Republic. Okay, so I, if I'm thirsty, I just am thirsty. And all that I want is drink. <laughs> and that's all that that little piece of my soul cares about or responds to is the fact that I'm thirsty and the fact that drink would satisfy me. So there's this other part of me though that knows in Socrates example uh, that, a, that the water that's available has been poisoned because let's say that we're out on a battlefield or whatever and the, mm -hmm. the enemy that has been retreating has poisoned all the wells in the land so that you know we, we will have trouble pursuing. Them. Okay, so I know for a fact that the water available is poisoned, but just having that knowledge about the outside world is not gonna change that thing inside of me that is thirsty, okay? So there's this fundamental disconnect between the piece of me that is cares about the truth, cares about the state of affairs in the real world, mm -hmm. and the piece of me that is thirsty and is not truth responsive, mm -hmm. right? And I think that there is a real uh, kind of correlation there between what Socrates is saying in The Republic and what Hildebrand is saying. There's these two fundamentally different sources of motivation, mm -hmm. right? Uh, Lloyd Gerson, a Plato scholar, calls the parts of the soul, and incidentally, Plato never does use the word parts to refer to these three parts that everybody talks about, okay? He calls them and said, archai of action. Okay? And, arch and archai in Greek is, is like a source or a font, okay? Something, the, the principle of action, principle of motivation, okay? And so the one is based fundamentally in me. It's based in my basic physiology, basic psychology, and is not really responsive to truth. And the other source of motivation is this thing that is 
pointed outwards towards reality. And so what could motivate that? Well, something out there in the world would have to be shining out and saying about itself, I am, I am worth pursuing for my own sake, mm -hmm. not just by appealing to some sort of mechanism inside of you. Right. But then we get this, the, this third piece, right? The thumos or ta epithumaticon, or sorry, that's the lowest, the ta um, thumaticon. Um, thumoides, sorry, I was <laughs> blanking on the word. Ta thumoides. Uh, because that is sort of reason responsive. There's all these passages where Plato talks about reason speaking to your thumos, chiding it giving it arguments, right? Saying, hey, you know, wouldn't it be better if? Uh, and yet it it's not reason. It's not your noose. So it's not fundamentally oriented towards the truth. So in other uh, places, Plato calls it the honor-loving part uh, or uh, the part that loves seeming rather than being. And so it has this weird kind of middle category where it does care about truth to the extent that it seems a certain way, either to me or to other people, right? How do I appear in front of other people? How's this gonna look, right? But it doesn't ultimately care whether it's real or not, right? And the, the solution for Plato, um, or one of the keys to the solution that you just asked is, how do we get that middle part to be the ally of reason rather than the ally of the appetites? Yeah. <laughs> because the part of me that cares about the way that I look, regardless of what's really true or not, is a psychologically powerful part. And so if I can get that hooked up in the right way, uh, subordinated to, but but still there, if I can get that hooked up to the part of me that really cares about reality and truth, then I stand a pretty good chance of overcoming the piece of me that wants to drink the poison water, <laughs> right? Uh, but if I ignore that part, then the part of me that like, yeah, but like, it looks fine. <laughs> uh, will will uh, be another thing that I have to contend with uh, in order to avoid the poison water. Mm -hmm. And I uh, so yeah, because I guess it's more of a, a hierarchy on in terms. So the the part of me that cares about how I appear is what's regulating the appetites, and then reason is in principle or could regulate that spirited aspect as well. But then mm -hmm. it could not, right? Because that's I suppose what the, what the problem of narcissists is like i guess that's uh is would would be that it really irreverent and not caring at all about uh eternal verities or whatsoever um right and these these are the kinds of people that uh plato says in the later books of the republic are dominant in an oligarchy right they're the people who just have that middle part of the soul is in charge so they're they're really pretty disciplined people because they, that part of them that cares about honor and cares about the way they look and cares about their reputation, it's actually pretty good at disciplining their appetites, but they don't care about truth at all, <laughs> right? That's, that's you know, uh, that's definitely subordinated to their honor and reputation. Mm -hmm. Yeah, definite recipe for a narcissist. 